I mean, one of the critical questions, obviously, with any disorder is the ability to accurately diagnose it. And one of the problems in the field of Parkinson's disease is the only way you can definitively diagnose someone's having a condition is to remove their brain, chop it up and a bit under the microscope, which isn't much use to the patient, isn't much use to anybody. So at the end of the day, the diagnosis still relies on the clinical acumen of the person seeing that individual. And although there are tests which are available to help exclude other causes, so in young people you can exclude rare metabolic causes, and you can do scans which look at, uh, I think called dopamine in the brain, which is deficient in people with the right clinical uh, symptoms and signs, that only helps you make the diagnosis, because the deficiency of dopamine can be seen in other conditions. So at the end of the day, you normally get the diagnosis right when you first see somebody, if you're a specialist in that area, about nine times out of ten. But that still means that one in ten people have an initial diagnosis of Parkinson's, which subsequently proves not to be the case. And those other diagnoses are often uh, a tremor, the thing called a central tremor, or one of these so-called Parkinsonian uh, plus conditions. Now that has implications. It obviously has implications because you're telling the patient they haven't, they've got a disease they haven't got. It also means when we come to trials, it can be a problem. So one in ten people, if you're treating de novo Parkinson's patients, don't actually have the condition you think they've got. So if your treatment is designed around the therapy for Parkinson's disease, then one in ten of your patients will actually fail your trial simply because you've got the wrong diagnosis. So one of the big challenges in the world of Parkinson's disease is to try and improve on that diagnostic uh, capability. And that obviously improves if you follow people over time because you can see how they develop, how they respond to therapy. It's often a very big clue. But as we've been hearing in other sessions, these pre-motor, prodromal features of Parkinson's can be quite helpful. So in my own practice back in the uh, UK, when I see people who may have very early Parkinson's disease, one of the very useful ways to try and uh, establish that diagnosis is not only through conventional uh, examination and possibly doing these uh, dopamine scans, these TAT scans, but it's asking people very specifically about other deficits which they may not volunteer when they come to clinic. So the absence of smell, have you lost your sense of smell over the last few years? And some patients will say that happened uh, a number of years uh, before they went to their doctor with their abnormalities with their movement. Acting out dreams at night, so-called REM sleep behavioural disorder, is another common feature of prodromal and early Parkinson's disease. And then you can ask other things about slowing up with walking, have other people notice you look a little bit depressed, you're a bit depressed, and things of that nature. Now, none of them themselves are helpful, because if I went down the high street of any city and said to people, have you noticed a problem with your smell, a problem with your sleep, a problem with your walking, your mood, your bowel, and things like that, then every single person would say yes to one aspect of it. But those positive answers to those questions in the context of someone who has very subtle abnormalities or very uh, difficult to pick up signs is a very helpful way of establishing the diagnosis. So the real challenge for, for Parkinson's disease in the future, if you like, is being able to diagnose the condition early. And as we've also heard, it may ultimately end up that the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is not made by neurologists or movement disorder specialists, but by people in other disciplines because of this problem of sleep and smell, possibly bowel problems. Having reliable markers which you can say definitely uh, correlate and predict that you have Parkinson's disease, not that they increase your chance, that would be a good starting point that they uh, make it more likely you've got it, but actually definitively linked to it. And if we can do that, that is important not only to tell people that they've got the condition which you think they've got, but it also has implications because the future, I would say, of the treatment of Parkinson's disease is hitting patients with therapies very early on in a much more aggressive way uh, than we perhaps do at the moment, or in fact, treatments which we don't currently have. So at the moment, that's what I would say the state of play is with respect to diagnosing uh, Parkinson's disease. And I'm happy to take any questions on that. Do you expect in the future that there may be a blood test with... Um... Uh, my honest answer is no. Uh, I think there could be tests which will help. So we're going to hear a little bit later about biomarkers. So I suspect what will happen in the future is you'll have someone who, who sounds as though they've got Parkinson's from what they tell you, and have subtleties uh, and, and features on examination which fit with Parkinson's disease. You may do a scan to show that they have a deficiency of dopamine on the scan. And then you may be able to use blood markers which give you an extra clue that it's that coupled to the scan, coupled to the signs, coupled to the symptoms, makes it more likely you've got Parkinson's. 
I would be very surprised if there is a way you could go along to the doctor, they take a blood sample, they take it to the clinical lab and come back saying, you got Parkinson's disease.